Hi, welcome to the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation's Live Better series. I am Julie Lubinsky. I am manager of web production for the foundation. And today we have with us Candace Cable. She is a nine time Paralympian, she's won 12 medals, and she also attended the Sochi Games as a journalist. And she has some special guests with us, so I'm going to let her um, speak about her guests. Thanks, Julie. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's always a great honor and opportunity to be able to share what our guests have to offer for us here at the Live Better series at the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. This, uh, this piece of the, the Live Better series is called Adapting Life because we're really learning how we can move through our lives with ease. You know, someone with a disability definitely has to learn how to adapt, but it really works that way for everyone. And with our guests that we have today, we're going to have the opportunity to get a picture of what a provider of custom, custom mobility systems has to do to make happen so that anyone who needs or uses a mobility device can do so easily and with the confidence that this equipment will be sustainably reliable. Now, joining us today is uh, we have Ray. We have we have Ray Kent who's going to be joining us, and we also are having Peter Orkin and Cindy Garcia. Now, Ray is an assistive technology professional and a certified rehabilitation technology supplier. He is one of the 77 nationwide branch managers for the referral-based company National Seating and Mobility. He is based in Fresno, California. And National Seating and Mobility is the only business, um, their only business is providing custom rehabilitation seating and mobility wheelchairs and adaptive seating systems, gait trainers, standers, walkers, and bath equipment for the most severely and physically challenged children and adults. Peter is the Vice President of Government and Payer Contracting of State Medicaid and Private Insurance Programs out of the Executive Office in Nashville. And with Peter and, you know, as well as Cindy and Ray, we're going to be discussing some California legislation that has created some massive cuts for com complex technology, and it really affects the pediatric users. Now, California, what, what I've learned with this is that California has the lowest rate of reimbursement in the nation. So it's really critical, as we learned in a previous webcast, that we take the skills that we learned from Madonna Long on how to be an advocate and use them with this information to really get back the, the funding that's needed. And we're going to learn what it really takes to live with a child who has a disability from Cindy Garcia. Her, her young daughter, Samantha, has, one, has been diagnosed with one of the rarest of the rare genetic syndromes, Dedenic. And I'm going to let her give you that full name because there actually were a couple parts of that that I couldn't even pronounce. So I know she's probably a professional with that after, after this time with her daughter. And Samantha is one of only eight children in the world diagnosed with this rare syndrome. So she's going to share with us what her daily schedule is like and also why it's critical that she has this assistive technology and also why she advocates so diligently. So I'm going to get started. So welcome, Ray, Peter, and Cindy. Thank you. Thank you much. Yeah, Thanks, so um, yeah, let's start, let's start with Ray because, um, Ray, I want you to talk about talk about a bit, um, you know, what are some of the pieces of, of national seating and mobility that are critical? I see that we have networking and education. What are some of the education pieces that are out there for people? Education in terms of what we do and who we are or? Absolutely. Um, well, we're a... Um, obviously national seating and mobility. So we're a national company. I believe at this point we have about 77 branches spread across the United States. Um, what you said in the earlier part of the bio, um, we basically provide complex rehab technology, 
mostly to pediatrics, but we also provide uh, as well to, to adults. And what that means is we, um, we provide custom seating and positioning equipment, um, primarily wheelchairs, but then all of the equipment that goes along with that um, that somebody would use in a home um, or in an uh, environment outside, uh, bath equipment, toileting, um, standers, gate trainers, and it's, it's sort of difficult to describe to people what those things are. I mean, when you say walker, people have a certain picture that comes to their mind, but uh, most of the things that we do, mm -hmm. even on standard pieces of equipment, we generally end up customizing in some way or other. Um, many times we have to cut things off, we have to modify things for size, for fit, for um, all those kinds of things. So that's what we do. Um, I don't and know is if it that custom answers built? Do you have do you have um, do you do you have uh, factories that custom build these things, or do you have areas where you make those adaptations that you were just talking about? Right. No, we do not manufacture the equipment. Basically, what we do is we spend time with doctors and therapists in the field, figuring out what particular piece of equipment a particular child will need, and then we um, make recommendations. Let's just take, for an example, um, a wheelchair. We have, as um, assistive technology professionals, we have a pretty good uh, repertoire of wheelchairs that we can pick from. There's not just one particular tilt and space chair. We probably have three or four or six or eight that we could pick from. That's where we come in. We buy that. We we find out what the therapist and the doctors want, how they want to see the child position, uh, what the um, parameters of the chair will be, and then we make suggestions on the wheelchair base, the seating positioning insert, um, based on what the therapists tell us, how much support the child needs, headrests, trunk supports, hip guides, all those things go into that. Then what we do is we, uh, after we take those specifications, we go back mm -hmm. to the office, put all of that in the computer, we send out, we get approvals, uh, from the various insurances, and then we order the equipment. When it comes into our shop, um, we put all of that together. It's all customized in the sense that the seat depths, the seat widths, the leg drops, the back heights, the chest widths, all those kinds of things uh, go into um, how a piece of equipment is put together and how it actually turns out. So it really sounds like it's a puzzle. You, you do the measuring, you look at what the needs are, and then you gather up all the pieces and put it together. Is that correct? Yes. And, yes. and, and much of the you time, also see, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, much of the time, even after we get a piece of customized equipment, we might get a wheelchair base from one company, we might get a seating system from another, a headrest right. from a third. Uh, once it all comes in and we put it together, it, um, we may still have to then do some customization in our own shop to make things work and to make things right. Well, and I know, you know, with my own wheelchair and also sporting equipment that I've used, that oftentimes there's, there's parts that don't fit with other brands. And, and that is the customizing that you're speaking of, right? Yes, it's, it's kind of amazing how, um, after all the years of doing this, how we're able to take um, bits and pieces from one brand and put them onto another brand, um, or it just there are, lo there are a lot of uh, pieces that we put together like that that, that make a piece, uh, a piece of equipment really work. Um, the arms might not be at the right height, and we may not be able to find a certain armrest that we need from one manufacturer, so we'll get it from somebody else, and we do a lot of that in our shop here. And looking at this picture right here, uh, where the, the foot plate is and, and then the area to hold the feet, I mean, I look at my foot plate and I just, you know, put my feet on it and off I go. Here it looks like there's multiple parts that have to be fit together to be able to, to fit for the person who's going to be using this wheelchair. And because you were talking about pediatrics, it means that it's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing and growing. Is that correct? That's correct. This particular chair has what they call a reaction component in, in it so that that footrest actually is on springs 
and if a child goes into extension, the footrest can be unlocked so that they can actually, with their feet on those foot plates and under the ankle straps, they can actually kick the foot plate out, almost like an elevating leg. But because it has a, um, a spring on it, it will then put some pressure on the child to then bring the feet back to normal position. So not only do you, you do the measuring, you, you gather up all the puzzle pieces, you put the puzzle pieces together, and when they don't fit, you have to customize those pieces so that they fit. And then you also maintaining, but you did mention that you also have to seek all the, the funding for this piece of equipment with the insurances. Right. You know, I, what I thought about as I was thinking about this webcast was, mm -hmm. uh, let me just take a second and walk you through what we do. And Thank I can you. tell I you what, it. okay, I can tell you what we get paid for and what we don't get paid for. And again, we want to emphasize this is really about access to equipment. Um, mm -hmm. However, in order to have equipment, access to equipment, somebody has to supply it and somebody has to be in business to do that. That's what we do. But basically, I will go out in the field, I schedule with a therapist, a, a generally a one-hour appointment at a medical therapy unit. We'll evaluate a child for, let's just say, a wheelchair and a seating system. Um, that takes probably about an hour. I have to write all that down, and we have to go back and forth to figure out exactly what we're going to be using on the chair, headrests, thoracic supports, all those things that I mentioned at the beginning. That's about an hour, so then I come back to the office, I input all that, um, if I don't have time in the field, I do it on the computer in the office, put it into the system. Then it goes through um, into our system. We send out to the insurance uh, companies and ask for, um, we send them the codes, and one of my processors codes the whole order. We send out to the insurance companies. They, whether it's Medicaid or private insurance, they then give us approvals or not, um, uh, most of the time we, we are pretty good at getting approvals. Once it's all approved, then we order the chair. Let's just say this particular chair has five vendors. There's a wheelchair base, there's a seating system, there's a headrest, there's a shoulder strap, there's a, uh, maybe a foot plate or um, uh, a hip belt. All of that then goes out to the manufacturers. It comes back into the warehouse uh, ordered. We order all those parts, they come in, then my techs in the back spend time putting all of that together and getting it all set up per the specifications that we took in the field. All the measurements need to be set up ahead of time. Footrest length, back height, chest width, all of those kinds of things. Once all that's done, then, and the piece of equipment is checked in, we call the therapist and say, okay, six to eight weeks down the road, okay, the piece of equipment's mm -hmm. in, we set up another appointment, we go back to the medical therapy unit, mom and child come, we fit the piece of equipment and make sure all the strapping works, make sure mom knows how to take the chair apart, how to put it back together, and all the things that we did with that particular piece of equipment. And I'm just speaking right now of a wheelchair. We do the same thing with gate trainers, we do the same thing with standers, uh, standing systems. Um, so once that's all done, um, and if we can deliver it at the time, we go ahead and get signatures and deliver the piece of equipment. Sometimes more customization is needed. We hope it doesn't, but sometimes it does. And so then we have to take the piece of equipment back to the shop, take notes, make further adjustments, then take it back out for a, a second appointment to deliver it. In all of that, this is considered a piece of equipment um, that is new, which means we get paid for no labor for any of this. I don't get paid for um, the original evaluation. We don't get paid for driving over and doing the, um, doing the fitting. We don't get paid for putting it together. And sometimes these complicated chairs can take two to three to four hours to put together in the shop. So when and, we get cut and back so and how cut many back hours? Cut. So Ray, how, sorry to interrupt you. How many hours do you need no, no, to put ahead. in with all that, li that lineup? Well, it just depends. Um, if, if I were to actually take the hour I evaluate it, take the hour I use to deliver it, plus the, anywhere from hour to three to four hours to put it together and adjust it, you know, there could be six or, six or seven hours if it's a power chair and it's complicated, sometimes longer than that. 
to put together, and it's considered new, so we don't get paid labor for any of that that we do up front. We just don't. And and looking at this picture, it does look extremely complicated. And if you add in all those hours of the measuring, of the going back and forth, all of that that you explained just now, how many hours do you think that would be in total? Just a guesstimate of what you put in that you don't get it reimbursed for, that you don't get paid for. Well, that's what I was saying. I think probably I would say anywhere, depending on the piece of equipment, the more complex, then the more issues we have. But I would say, or we can have, we try to not get the issues. Mm -hmm. We try to make everything right at the beginning. But I would say right. probably anywhere from three to seven hours, and that's just a ballpark figure depending on the complexity of the piece of equipment mm -hmm. right, that we don't get reimbursed for. And when you get the equipment ready and you have your you have your your child coming in with their parent, say Cindy, who we have with us today, what is it that you do with her to get it ready for Samantha? Well, what we try to do is the the um the tech in the shop that puts all the equipment together looks over my spec sheet. I have a specification sheet that tells him or should tell him how to set up all the measurements ahead of time. So he sets it up based on the information that I gave him as best he can in the shop. When I take the piece of equipment out, and on the complex rehab equipment, I pretty much do all of my own end fitting because it just goes better that way. Um, because I originated the equipment, I know what I want, I know what I want to see, I know what the therapist wants to see, so I'll take it out in the field. Um, let's just say I'm going to fit um, Samantha into a wheelchair. We would go out mm -hmm. and meet at the MTU, put her in the wheelchair, take a look at how everything fits. Uh, and by the way, on pediatrics, we try to build uh, three to five years of worth of growth into each one of these systems. So those are other things that we have to do when we first spec out the equipment. But basically, then I would sit down and we would put her in the seat and move things that need to be moved and make sure everything works right, make sure everything fits right. And if mom's happy and Samantha's happy and the therapist is happy, then I'm happy. <laughs> and the equipment gets delivered. <laughs> oh, okay. And so, um, Cindy... Tell us what it's like when you get a new piece of equipment for Samantha. And then, really, uh, as we go along, I want to know what your day is like. We have some slides for that, too. And, and really appreciate Peter, Ray, and Cindy for being on the line with us today. It's just, this is a great information, I think. Well, once we um, receive the equipment from um, Ray and National Senior Mobility, um, then it's time for us to put it to use and good use for uh, us and Samantha. Um, basically, it's trying to get you the equipment, uh, making sure that we give Samantha's body time to adjust to the equipment. Um, the wheelchairs aren't um, nearly as bad, but some of the other equipment can be like a standard or so forth because, again, we are um, forcing some of those muscles that are Basically, in place already, we're, we're trying to stretch them out and get them um, to where they need to be so they are able to be um, more mobile. Um, so once we do get that equipment, it's just for us on our end trying to get used to it, figure it out, and uh, take care of it. Because as Ray has said, we need it to last three to five years. And how long does it take for Samantha usually to get used to a new piece of equipment? Uh, it depends on the equipment, um, but we start putting her in it right away the minute we receive it. Um, it's almost like receiving, it's a gift, basically, that we're receiving. Um, that may sound funny to some people, but we're very excited to receive it, so we start using it right away because we desperately need it. But it usually takes her, it usually takes about anywhere from about a week to two weeks um, for her to get used to it, and that's with cons with us using it consistently. And you know, I have to tell you, I fully understand the use of the word gift because it really is a gift to mobility. I mean, for anyone who has any mobility impairment, they understand 
in a huge way how important it is to have this piece of equipment and also to have this piece of equipment working and and at your fingertips anytime you want to be able to use it because it's the only way we can get around. I mean, I uh, I heard from someone not too long ago that you know, for every 10 people who need a wheelchair, and I'm just talking wheelchairs right now in the world, only three have them. And, uh, you know, so for us, it's a gift. It truly is, and I really appreciate your use of the word. So how does the, how does the, uh, I saw this picture here where you went to Disneyland, and you get out and you're about, and I see so many pieces on this wheelchair what does it take to keep it maintained? Um, it takes a lot. Um, I'm kind of a neat freak anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm constantly <laughs> cleaning the chair. Um, I like it to be clean because I think it's important. It's important for Samantha. She's in it all the time. Um, but it, it, it takes a lot. Um, basically, right now, um, we just have um, a standard vehicle. And so um, we need to break that wheelchair down. The seat um, actually comes off from the frame of the wheelchair, and we take that off. And then the actual wheelchair kind of folds up. The handlebars come down. Uh, the foot plates kind of come up, and it kind of like um, folds kind of like a, a folding stroller um, in a sense. And so um, it, it takes a little bit of time um, if you're going anywhere or doing anything um, normal, um, I should say, going to school, um, getting in the car, getting out of the car, you've got to take some extra time to make sure that, you know, you're putting together the equipment correctly because if it's not put together correctly, then obviously, you know, your child's not sitting in it properly and it's not doing the job it's supposed to be doing for them. So um, it does take some time um, to do that and then right. to make sure that... But it's maintained correctly too, a lot. You know, well, we're and, <laughs> and and as you said about, and I apologize for talking over you. It's one of the the downsides of the webcast is that it takes a little bit of time. But I know from personal experience using a wheelchair, everything that I do takes three to five times longer than it does for someone who's walking. So when you say it takes a little bit of time, I think you're really you're downgrading it quite a bit. I'm, yeah, how long I am. does it really take? <laughs> I, to, I mean, let's it be is. honest here. How long does it um, really take to break down that wheelchair and get it in the car? If your body is um, it's still working properly, let me also put that into play. <laughs> um, Absolutely. As I get older, as I get older, and Samantha gets older and bigger, it gets more difficult, and I never realized that. So when I say a little bit of time, I mean you're talking about a good extra 15, 20 minutes. Um, a good day is probably 10 to 15 minutes. And that's just getting into the vehicle and getting the wheelchair into the vehicle and me getting into the vehicle. Um, and we're just talking about me and Samantha. Um, we do have other family members too that I need to get in. But typically just me and Samantha getting in, into the vehicle, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes for us to physically get into the vehicle. Okay, and and having this equipment fit properly, and is you know being pointed out to me uh, in the chat box here that it can actually help lessen the disability significantly. And have you felt that and seen that with Samantha? Um, if you're not using it properly, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, you're, if you're not using it properly, I mean. I mean, basically, you're hurting their body is, is the way I look at it. Um, you're mm -hmm. not if doing not their body properly. Stuff. If it's not fit that's, properly, correct. And that's why, that's why your provider is such a critical piece of it, as Ray was saying about getting the right fit in and also getting ready for the growth that happens with the child. And, and what about, you know, if you, you can't have this equipment, if you didn't have this equipment, what would it be like for you? Um... The best word I can use would be devastating. Um, basically, we are not giving Samantha her full potential of life that we could give her if we did not have this equipment. That means basically we would have to be staying at home, sitting at home, and not be able to function in society like 
you know, they should, should be doing. Um, that would mean not going to school. That would mean not being able to go to doctor's appointments, um, mm-hmm. and which is critical because obviously these kids need the care that, you know, the rest of us do, if not ten times more. Um, we, you know, we wouldn't be doing anything. We would be sitting at home, and that's just not what I have in picture of my child doing. I want them to be, I want her to be a part of society like all the other kids are. And your day is already, I mean, if you didn't have this equipment, you're saying that all of these things would happen, but your day is already labor intensive in many, many ways and dependent on much equipment that you you have the feeding that, that you're doing. Explain to us a little bit about just getting out the door, and then um, and then we can find out some ideas of how we can help with this. Sure. So um, basically, our our day starts off with you know obviously us getting Samantha up in the morning. Um, I think also take into effect kids that have or anybody that has any type of disability or special needs. I've noticed with Samantha it takes a little bit of time to get her up and get her going. It takes time for her body to start working. Um, It's not like our body. Um, So typically um, our day starts off around 7, 7.30 in the morning. Um, And from 7 to 7.30 in the morning, um, I am basically getting her ready for school. Um, I need to lift her up and put her into her chair. after I get her dressed, and then once we do that, we start getting her prepared for the day. Um, anything typical, like we do brush our teeth, comb her hair. Um, but that also plays into the factor that you know sometimes the kids are just not in the best mood, and it takes extra time. So right. To get up morning at seven seven thirty, we are barely getting out the door by nine or after nine um, to get into the vehicle, which again, takes another 15, 20 minutes to get out the door. Um, Again, I have to give her body time to wake up, to get moving. Um, If I don't, she's extremely stiff, um, and I have to also stretch her out. So, you know, for us getting up, I can personally get up and get ready, you know, in the day, 45 minutes to an hour. But obviously with this, it's taking me, you know, at least a couple of hours to do the bigger that she's getting, it's getting more difficult. And if I did not have the equipment um, that you see on the screen, mm-hmm. I don't know what I would do. There would be, it, it would be impossible for us to just to get out and, and do the things in life that everybody should be doing. And it's not only you know, the mobility equipment that, that you showed me, it's the things in your home too to create safety for, for Samantha and make it so that she can actually move around the house too in a safe manner. So, and these things, they all take funding. They all have this piece of, of need just so that we can have strong lives that we feel like we're a part of and contributing. And, so now I want to get Peter in on the conversation, and and uh, I know that this slide just says Medi-Cal, um, and it's Medicaid, and it's also private insurance, but I, I really want to hear what the issue here is in California, because I know that these issues happen in other states, and I think that we can take what's happening in California to really bring to the forefront so that people can, can really begin to take action and be a part of getting it going in the back in the right direction so that people are, that are working the mobility systems, the parents, the families, and, and the legislature are working in the right direction to be able to make it so that everybody has a life with dignity. So Peter, I'm going to ask you to let us know what this concern is that we want to talk about here. Thank you, Candace, and, and thank you, Cindy, too, for your, your, your information that you provided to it's uh, uh, amazing uh, what one can overcome when they have the uh, the right technology and that's what uh, here at National City Mobility we try to make sure uh, you know that everyone has access to you know what they deserve to allow them to live life with dignity like you said and and to live an everyday normal life and one of the major struggles that we're facing right now 
uh, is in the state of California. Uh, this state, uh, despite many meetings and many presentations that we've done to the department and the office of the governor and the legislature, um, has refused to acknowledge the unique nature of the product that we pro provide, this complex rehab technology, you know, and the labor intensity of how the CRT equipment we provide uh, is truly an extension end user. Uh, through the budget process uh, and over the last 24 months, the state of California has reduced rates for all complex rehab technology chairs and, and the equipment that's uh, provided uh, to our beneficiaries by 10%. Um, and that went into effect uh, in October of last year. And so since that time, we as providers have been living with, uh, you know, the reality of operating at the lowest reimbursement rates in the country for the pediatric uh, manual and power chairs and, as Ray said, uh, the most labor-intensive uh, products that are provided under those uh, allowables. Um, Ray used an analogy, what we use in, uh, as an industry standard is between 12 and 20 hours of labor and, and by the time you have billable services and everything approved, uh, there's a ton of labor that goes into this product. So on top of a 10% cut that was enacted by Governor Brown's budget uh, last biennium, they also went ahead and, and did a 5% retroactive cut for an 18-month period. And what that means is on products that we delivered 18 months prior to October of 2013, the state has come back and said, we're going to take 5% of the amount that we paid you and recoup that back. So we're hitting uh, not only a 10% cut going forward, but they're essentially saying, hey, you did work at a rate that we approved, and now we're going to take it back. So it puts a significant amount of stress on providers. You know, every day we see qualified providers uh, that have accredited uh, ATPs that are going out of business because they cannot continue to operate under these reimbursement rates in California. You know, our clients, uh, they're all success stories, and their ability to adapt, go to school and go to work and live a normal life they're, that's all due to their uh, access to CRT, uh, power mobility, and manual chairs, and it allows them, again, to live their life with dignity and, uh, and just an everyday normal life. Uh, and again, because of this significant rate cut and the retroactive cut, we're seeing providers every day go out of business. And we're faced with the reality going forward that we don't know if we'll be able to continue to operate in California unless the governor's office is able to make uh, some changes to uh, the way that CRT is reimbursed. Now, when, he, when, you know, when I say he, I'm talking about Governor Brown released his first budget earlier this year. Uh, unfortunately, uh -huh. it did not address uh, a change to the uh, fee schedule for complex rehab technology uh, for uh, pediatric mobility in the state of California. And then just yesterday, uh, he released his May revise, which is the second draft of his budget. Again, unfortunately, uh, despite many meetings and uh, you know, just a ton of effort on the part of all providers in the state of California, uh, we were unsuccessful to get uh, the reimbursement for pediatric wheelchairs changed in the state of California. So they still going ahead with these uh, unsustainable rates and, and low payments in the state. So it's been a very frustrating road. Uh, we're not giving up on it. We're continuing to work with the state. We have about four months to really get in front of everyone and make sure that they really understand how crucial this technology is to the end user. And more importantly, what it means if someone doesn't have access to this. They're going to lose their ability to go to school, go to work. You know, mom and dad might not be able to go to work anymore because someone is going to have to be home with, with the child during the day. And, and just what it means to their dignity and, and, and their ability to, again, live a normal, everyday life. Now, Peter, what can we do to be able to turn this back in the right direction? Well, we're... Uh, we're being told, and when I use the, the we statement, I'm talking about providers in the state of California, that the only way we're going to see any change is if we can get to the office of the governor to have him uh, specifically acknowledge that, you know, if these providers go away, there's going to be an access issue in the state of California. Now, we've already seen, a, again, a significant amount of providers 
stop supplying uh, CCS and secret beneficiaries. You know, as a result of the devastating news that we received yesterday, that the governor is not going to change the reimbursement model for CRT. I think we're going to see uh, even more uh, that, that go out of business. So, you know, what we're asking is that as many uh, end users or beneficiaries get involved and, and really stress to the state how important their CRT equipment is to them and you know, what it would mean if they didn't have that equipment. You know, one of the things we're seeing, Candace, and it's really unfortunate and it, it pains me to say this, is you know, in the absence of qualified providers, we're seeing a lot of, you know, kind of one-shot wonders or, or companies who do not have accredited ATPs on staff that are coming into markets and maybe taking some, uh, some clinic days because, you know, they're going to provide uh, cheap equipment with non-accredited uh, therapists and, mm -hmm. and they're going to provide something that doesn't last the five years that it's required to under the uh, CCS or uh, Medi-Cal formula. Uh, you know, the, the end result is going to be devastating. When you start talking about the cubus ulcer or uh, what a pressure sore costs or, you know, what that tolls on the beneficiary, and it, this is all just a result of just underpaying and, and looking at the now, right now, and, and saying, hey, I'm going to save this small chunk right now and, and provide a cheap uh, piece of equipment that's not provided by a true professional, and then it's, you know, it, right now it's going to be a big cost savings. Well, unfortunately, that really, it, it hurts the state down the road because they're going to end up paying for you know, new technology when the technology that, that was provided breaks or when the wrong seating system goes in, they'll end up paying for a pressure sore or ulcer. And these are very, very real scenarios that when they look at it with this narrow-minded approach and do not fund these codes properly, unfortunately, those are re the realities. You know, it's, it's not uh, the state that's going to be hurt. It's, it's honestly, it's the pediatric population that will suffer as a result of this, uh, these cuts. Yes, I understand what you're saying because, you know, Cindy said that the chair has to last four to five years, and with all those parts that are, make that chair fit Samantha in the way that really supports her, and maybe even lessens her disability, she can't get those kind of results with something that is just put together haphazardly to just last for the moment. And so what is it that we as end users and even people that don't have children but want to get involved with this because we know this is an issue that's really important, it will affect us as adults, and, and it will actually down the line, if we think about it, it affects everyone because we're all just temporarily able-bodied in this world. We're going to be affected by disability some way, somehow. And what can we do that supports the campaign that you already have in place? So what we're being directed to, and, and there are, you know, it's, it's important to state that there are um, a couple of uh, assembly bills that are in the process of being introduced that will rescind these cuts, but Again, all the counsel that we're receiving in the state of California is that the most important uh, you know, way to focus our energy is to the Department of Health Services. And there's two individuals there, uh, Obi Douglas, who is the director of, of Medi-Cal Services, or the, the Medicaid program, um, and also Mary Cantwell, um, who is uh, a deputy director under Mr. Douglas, and, and been in several of the meetings that we have tried to make our point to them. And again, you know, we left that last meeting with a, what we thought was an understanding that we had made some ground with the department. You know, when you start looking at uh, this impending access issue, it's scary. Uh, there's such, uh, so few providers that provide this type of technology in the state of California. And it's such a massive state that you start talking about there's two providers that provide 67% of this technology. And there's, you know, at the end of the day when you start going down through the smaller providers, there is eight providers that make up 95% of all the CRT services in the state of California for fee for service, and every day we're only seeing the eight. So you just said only eight providers, and actually one provider has stopped. Is it New Mobility? 
that has stopped uh, taking clients? Yeah, yeah new motion. Who uh, again is a, you know it's Thank a, you. again when when I use the the we statement, I'm not talking specifically about national seating and mobility. I'm talking about right. you know all of our NCART members, um, all of the, the providers that are out there because. We truly are, you know, at the end of the day, sure, you're competitors, but we're all working towards the same goal, which is making sure beneficiaries and the, the, the lives of the pediatric population, the adult population in California are properly taken care of. It's really important to note that, you know, and, and Cindy, and you, you can attest to this, and, and Candice, I know you can as well, and, and the relationship that you build with your ATP is, uh, you know, it's second to none. They, they know uh, the way your body moves and what makes you comfortable and how active you are and what chair you, you need. And it's very similar to that of your, your, your family doctor. And when you eliminate, you know, the, a provider from the market, what that does is take away a lifelong resource that the beneficiary has had and all of a sudden makes them start over with someone new and they have to learn the process all over again and you risk additional injury uh, you know going forward so it's really important to make sure that we continue to sustain those relationships and when we don't have the proper funding those are things that are in jeopardy we worry about you know a, a smaller uh, a company that comes in that maybe has provided uh, let's say a group two scooter uh, all across the nation through a competitive bid market they don't have an ATP on staff and all of a sudden decided you know, because California doesn't require an ATP to provide Medi-Cal services for pediatrics, well, let's get into the complex rehab technology, you know, game. Let's try it out. What's the worst that can happen? Well, the worst that can happen is you can significantly damage a, a beneficiary in their life and their, their ability to grow and develop and live a long, strong, normal life. And, and so the risk is, is you know, it, it, it pains me to say stuff like this because it's so short-sighted, you know, little, little Band-Aid cuts like this, and they really are not doing a long job, a great job of looking at the, you know, the big picture of this problem. So, you know, that being said, we're asking everyone to direct their energy towards Toby Douglas and Mary Cantwell in uh, California Department of Health Services to really explain to them how important it is that they have the proper technology and how important it is that they fund this at the right uh, you know, reimbursement rate to make sure that the children of California and adults have access to their ATP, to the right technology, and you know, just access to make sure that they can live and work and go to school like everyone else can. And what we'll do is we will get that contact information from you and we'll be able to post it on the Christopher and Dana Reeve website with the, this webcast being archived and the resources and any other resources that you'd like to pass along to us. We'd also um, like to open up the lines, I think, right now to see if anybody has any specific questions for our experts because um, you can put something in the chat box or um, I think, Carlos, you could open up the lines and we can um, individually take phone calls if someone has questions they want to ask? Sure thing. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone. You will hear a 3 tone prompt technology request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1, followed by the 3. Once again, if you have a question, please press 1, 4 on your telephone keypad. One moment, please. Thank you, Carlos. All right. So um, we don't have anything really in the chat box, but I, um, I had a, a question, and it's just my own personal curiosity. The right reimbursement rate, were you getting that rate before all of this change took place? Well, you know, and, it, 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 Yeah, go sure. ahead. I was going to say, anybody can answer that. Yeah, sure, oh. this is, you know, I'll take that. You know, it was, uh, California historically has been, um, you know, a, a poor payer in terms of complex rehab technology. Um, but, you know, we were finding a way to make it work. And we've been very honest with the department to the point where, you know, we've offered up internal audits so they can see that we're, you know, you're losing money on the, the products provided in the state of California. And we've made a good faith commitment to them that to continue working with them through the budget season, which ends at the end of June. Their new budget starts on July 1. 
uh, as long as they're willing to listen to us, that we wouldn't make any significant changes to our portfolio or, or to the lives of our clients. We would not refuse any uh, you know, repairs or a, any adjustments that had to be made to these stairs. But there's some really tough decisions that are going to have to be made if the state does not continue to listen to us and, and keeps them at these rates right now. So I won't say that they were, um, by no means, were there great rates before, but I will uh -huh. go as far as to say that they're absolutely terrible and unsustainable at this level right now. Well, and I think that a lot of people um, have a misconception that providers are, you know, jacking up the prices and making lots and lots of money. Um, and and from my own personal experience, I, I know that that's not true. And so can you speak to that a little bit? To, to sure. In, in 2007, there was a, a study that was done by the Smith School of Business, which is uh, associated with the University of uh, I believe Pittsburgh, and, and I will provide that also with you that you can put up with this information when we uh, post this to the site. And what it stated okay. at that time is that you know, the cost of a product is X in between you, when you have the labor on the other side. It did a complete study of uh, all providers nationwide, uh, or a large handful, and found that there would be, there'd be a, a profit rate of somewhere around uh, 5 to 7 percent. Now, that's in 2007. Now, over the course of the last seven years, as we all know as a constant variable, there, there's three variables that are in that figure. There is labor cost, there's product cost, and then there's reimbursement rate. So if we were talking about 7% in 2007, since that time, we have saw employment costs grow, go up from somewhere between 2 to 3% a year. We saw product costs go up to somewhere around 3 to 5% a year. And we saw our total reimbursement rate being cut at California at 10%, and now a 5% retroactive cut. So again, based on that study, you know, that's something that we use to the state at all times that, you know, we're not, you cannot live off that. There's no revenue in that. And, and the business school study that was done at the University of Pittsburgh will prove that. And Cindy, thank you, Peter. And Cindy, I wanted to ask you, you know, along the lines of having the proper equipment that fits properly, what does that add to Samantha's life as far as um, her ability to, you know, have a full life, a life that allows her to participate? Um, having a wheelchair and be able to get out into the community and being able to do the simple things that a lot of people take for granted, um, going to school, um, letting her get an education just like everybody else, um, out there means um, a lot. Um, it means everything to us to, you know, be able to put her in a proper chair and for her to be able to, to succeed in life and to also know that she is able and capable of doing things with proper equipment, you know, to go on and further herself and push her body and learn how to to work her body, which she has a hard time doing um, neurologically and physically. Um, so, it, you know, I would just encourage everybody to contact the California legislators, um, make phone calls, write emails, emails in detail of basically what I'm explaining that I'm just a needle in a haystack. There are so many people out there that are just like this, but it's affecting. Detail it out. Send them pictures. Explain why this is so important. Explain the cut that has already happened. How has it affected you? If there was more cuts, how even more in-depth it would affect us? Um, so please, I would just um, make phone calls, emails, just continuously um, let them know. Don't just send one. Continuously send it and let them know. Again, as Peter said, we are running on a short deadline. and the work that's already been put into it obviously um, didn't get looked at very thoroughly for us. So I think that it's very important that we continue to, you know, keep advocating for everybody. You know, this affects everybody, as Peter said. It's, it's you know, the vendors. It's us as family. And more importantly, it's our kids that it's affecting. Well, and as you, you know, you said, Cindy, when you said um, just a needle in a haystack, well, one of the things we learned when we did our advocacy webcast with Madonna Long was that 
one phone call is worth 10. And that's huge. That's power. So if you're making 10 phone calls, you're making 100 phone calls. That's the impact that it has. So it's not just a little thing when we make a phone call or we shoot off an email or even when we tweet. You know, is there, um, now that this came to mind about tweeting, is there a Twitter campaign that's being used for this program? Sure, we are using uh, through Mobility NSM our social media. Uh, Mark Queen is um, in a campaign, and also through NCART as well. They're both uh, directing this towards uh, California legislators uh, to try to garner support for these issues. Um, you know, also everything's we're, we're trying to point it at the office of the governor to, to draw support with help. Um, and, and I can get all that information to you uh, very shortly here and connect you with Mark as well to make sure that everyone who is on this podcast that listens to it uh, has access to that information. And it's so powerful. I mean, we have to, I mean, that was another thing that we learned, that the social media aspect of this can really turn things around. And another piece of it is talking about the issue. That was one of the things that, that Madonna spoke to us about was really you never know who is affected by an issue that you think is important. Even if you might think it's someone that you're talking to someone that has nothing to do with it, they might know someone that knows someone that knows someone. So talking about the issue is a, has a big piece of it as well as taking action. Cindy, I wanted to ask you one more thing about Samantha was, has she, with the proper complex technology and equipment, has she exceeded what the doctors expected of her? <laughs> Most definitely. Most definitely she has. Um, we were given little hope, um, like most families. And Samantha actually has enough trunk support thanks to some of the technology that we were able to get in equipment. Um, mm -hmm. She has enough trunk support to set up on her own now. Um, and there's two sides to that. There's you know, you're so excited to see your child go on and succeed and do things that people told you that weren't going to happen. And then now we're at the, the level of her body has grown, and so we need more equipment to continue that because as her body has grown, I have seen a decline in the strength that she has because she's trying to adapt to her body again. Um, so continuing on and having the proper equipment means so much um, to us and to, to have the level of expectations of your kids um, and to be able to do just basic daily life things, set up, eat, walk, talk. I mean, it all takes into part. So um, I can't express, like, again, a gift of having the stuff to, to, for her to succeed that doctor said she wasn't going to do. It, it's huge. It's priceless. It's completely priceless. Right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that because it's beyond words really when um, we see a diagnosis and so often <clears throat> that it's so debilitating to people and then see that once there's been equipment or technology added in, they've suddenly gone way past <clears throat> what anyone ever expected of them. And Ray, I wanted to ask you a question about what it feels like for you when you know that you've gotten the proper equipment and technology together and you, you see someone using it. What is that feeling like? Well, I'm pretty passionate about this. I've been doing um, complex rehab for about 29 years now, and I've seen all the ups and downs in the industry. I've seen... Um, I, I just have a real empathy for the kids, and I and it's uh, it just it's it's it, well. I think what Cindy said is is true. It's priceless to see um, the right kind of equipment provided, where you see uh, children gaining function, or you see them overcoming obstacles. Uh, there's uh, there are all kinds of illustrations, but there's nothing quite like, for example, seeing a kiddo the first time. Um, you put them into somebody who could use a power chair and they've never been able to walk and they get in a power chair and drive across the room. It's priceless. It's unbelievable to see 
um, the fact that now they can move themselves, whether it's a power chair uh, or it's a manual chair or it's just being able to sit up when you're not laying down in a bed all the time. Um, it's just, yeah, it's great, and I love it. And, um, you know, I have therapists all the time saying, are you planning on retiring? And it's like, no. <laughs> I like the job. And, it, and I don't consider it a job, it just, but I love it. I mean, people say, well, you sell wheelchairs. I don't sell wheelchairs. We provide equipment, and it's, that's why I'm in it. I just have a real passion for the kids and for the parents. And, and um, so that's why I've been at it for 29 years, and I'll probably be at it for another 10. <laughs> Can I Thank say you. one more thing? Absolutely, absolutely, please. Okay, there's there's one thing that was that sort of goes back to okay, providing equipment. Two things popped into mind, actually three. There's one code with Medi-Cal for a helmet, whether it's a soft shell helmet that's just a helmet, or whether it's a hard shell helmet that has a face bar and some other accessories on it. We get paid one price for all of them, and it the the price that we actually get reimbursed on the least expensive is really not enough at this point. So if we have a kiddo that has seizures, let's just say they have drop seizures and they fall forward on their face or they fall backward mm -hmm. on their heads, a soft shell helmet won't cut it. You have to get a hard shell helmet because it has to take up a lot of shock. Well, we get paid the same whether we provide a hard or a soft shell, and so we've had to quit providing hard shell helmets. We just can't do it. I mean, it, you basically give them away. Now, for some of our clients that we've dealt with for years and years, if we, th if we see there's a huge need, sometimes we'll go ahead and do it and just absorb the cost of it because we've been dealing with somebody for so long. The other thing is um, forearm crutches, lost strand forearm crutches. Um, they used to pay each, an each price. Now that they've cut the price back, and they pay us the same for a pair as they used to pay for each, and it doesn't even cover our cost. So they say, well, just find them somewhere else. So we go out in the, in the industry, and, and we try to find a pair of, and I did this once. I, I tried to find a pair of Lost Strand. I found one that was really inexpensive, and I was, had real misgivings about it, but I provided them, and it was within a month. The kiddo had fallen because the crutch had snapped off where the rivets were driven through for the handle. And so that was it. I did it one time, and I'm, I just, I don't do it again. Uh, and so we can't provide forearm crutches here because there's no reimbursement for it. Lift slings, Hoyer lift slings, it's the same thing. If we try to provide a sling, we just basically eat it because the, the reimbursement allowable is so low. And those are really minor things that we actually as a company, it's up to my discretion as to whether I provide those or not. And if I deal with somebody for a long enough time because they're lower priced items sometimes, I'll just put them in because they need them. They've got to have them in order to get around or in order to be mobile. And so we go ahead and provide them anyway. But when you take all that Pete has said about all the cutbacks and mix that in, you realize, uh, you know, it's cut to the bone and there's, there's no more there there. And it's, the state really has to wake up. And, you know, as Cindy said, as Samantha's getting and growing, she's getting older and growing, that it's getting more challenging for her to be able to to do the things she needs to do and then not having access to some of that equipment will make it so that Samantha can't get out and and that that then it just really dissuades the whole idea of having this equipment. It's just sitting there gathering dust because no one can use it. So they don't have all the well, right pieces. It does, and the other thing that happens, when, when kids grow, they get bigger. And when kids get bigger, moms have to lift more weight. And mm -hmm. anything over right. 50 pounds, and so what do you do in a situation where now you have two people that have a problem? You have a, a kiddo that's gotten so big that when mom tries to move, or mom or dad even, and they hurt their back, now we have a real situation because now nobody can move the kiddo from bed to chair to bath in and out, and, you know, um, I don't know if people think in these terms, but if you take um, a, a child that, say, weighs 50, 60, 70 pounds in a bathtub, even with a bath support, when they're wet to try to get them in and out, it's it's unbelievable. 
And it's Absolutely. the kind of thing that most people do not think about. They just, it's just not in our grid to think that way. But that's what these moms and these families have to deal with. And it's 24-7, you know, vacations, right. eh, probably right. not. Weekends off, I'm sorry. Um, so nope. it's, it's a really yeah. big deal. It is a big deal, and and I really appreciate that you brought up the the whole concept of that they don't think about it, and they don't think about it because they don't have to think about it. And we're here right. to make sure that they think about it because it is going to affect them. It affects all of us. Disability, no one gets away from disability, whether you're That's born right. with it or it's acquired. And so, so I honestly, we're at the top of the hour. We could go on and on and on, and I so appreciate. My guest today, Peter, Cindy, Ray, for being here and sharing this with us, enlightening us, enlightening me to what I can do and, and what is, what's needed. And I really appreciate our audience here spending the time listening to this. Please come back to the resource page. Get the information so that you can do something about this because it's not just in California. It's happening in other mm-hmm. states too, and it's going to continue. You know, it's kind of... What they were saying about the tax laws recently, that a lot of a lot of corporations are going outside the United States to try to, to get a better tax break. And if we don't change our tax laws in this country, we won't be able to keep up. And it's the same with this. It's the same with this. We have to get our, our representatives to understand that they can't take these things away, that it's going to, it affects us all. And... It's the children that are getting affected right from the beginning. And so I have to leave it on that note because I, it's, it's very challenging. And mm-hmm. I appreciate all of you taking the time to spend with us and, and really to give us this, this information. Thank you so, so much. 